thank you all very much for joining us here at the Institute for Government today. My name is Gemma Tetlow. I'm Chief Economist here at the Institute for Government. And I'm delighted to be joined by John Fingleton today, who was Chief Exec of the Office of Fair Trading from 2005 until 2012, and now runs his own company providing strategic advice to clients on competition, regulation, and public policy. And John is here today to talk about a new paper that he has written, raising concerns about some proposed changes the government is planning to make to the mergers and competition regime in the UK. So, John, you've been quite strong in your, your statements. I think some people may have seen them on the Today programme this morning or in the FT uh, this morning as well. For those who, who haven't been following this area so closely, can you just outline briefly what are the proposed changes and why are you so concerned about what's suggested? Okay, thank you, Gemma. It's very nice to be here and nice to see so many people in the audience. I know I, I think I've probably managed to bring some competition aficionados to the Institute of Government <laughs> for the first time. So, um, <clears throat> so the, the, the changes um, in essence are we have, a, we have a public interest test around national security at the moment, and the intention is to get rid of that and create a new, if you like, um, regulatory bureaucracy that will look at national security cases. And, and this is in cases where a company is one company is taking over yeah. another or buying a large so shareholder. So it covers not just acquisitions and mergers. It also covers um, share purchases, um, control or influence over a company, um, investments generally. It can include loans. It can include land purchases. So it's a very broad provision and much broader than the current law um, applies to. It's also important to note that it covers UK as well as foreign firms. So um, it's not a foreign investment, um, just a foreign investment law, which some countries have. It's a, a law that would control UK companies buying in, or investing in UK companies. Um, it, at the moment, the National Security Act goes through the CMA. It would bypass the CMA, Competition, Com Markets, Competition Authority. Markets Authority, and would just be de decided directly by the Bayes Department in the event that the decision under the national security test was in conflict with the Competition and Markets Authority one, the minister has the ability to overrule the Competition and Markets Authority. That's the case at the moment. Um, but given that there's been, I think, 15 cases of, national, of, of public interest overall, national security and others, in 15 years, about one a year, um, and the government here is envisaging um, intervening 50 times a year, so we're talking about a 50-fold increase in the level of intervention. Um, there's something quite um, unusual about thinking that national security threat has changed enough to move from one a year or less than one a year to 50 a year for, for requiring intervention. And so under the current system, in very rare cases, the Competition and Markets Authority yeah. may be tasked with investigating whether a merger threatens national security. Is that... So, I'll just back up to the Enterprise Act. So the 2002 Enterprise Act came in um, after the Bank of England was made independent. Uh, Gordon Brown's big announcement in 2001 was independent competition authorities. And uh, Ireland did the same at the same time. And in fact, other countries like France moved their merger regime more to copy the UK one. So I think that period of the, the early noughties was a period in which the UK took a very bold step forward on in political independent merger policy and actually didn't just do it at home but advocated it abroad and had some success um, in doing that. <clears throat> there are three exemptions um, in there for public interest. So the two original ones were national security and media plurality and standards. Um, and in 2008, we introduced a third one, financial stability, and that was to deal with the Lloyds HBOS merger. Mm -hmm. The media plurality one has been used five times, um, twice in the last year. Obviously, people know about the Sky, the cases involving Sky. There's been no competition concerns, but um, you can very easily see how a media merger might have no competition concerns, but you might be concerned about plurality or standards. Um, and so we have tests in there about the quality of the owner and about the diversity of the media. And that system's worked very well, <coughs> and it has not resulted in any anti-competitive mergers being allowed, for example. Um, the, the, the financial stability one is very interesting because it's the only case where explicitly the government has, has intervened to allow um, a merger that the OFT at that time, it's exactly 10, months ago, 10 years ago this month that I was writing that um, decision saying that, that that raised competition concerns. It's the only time the government has overruled um, a merger and allowed a potentially anti-competitive merger in the interest of financial stability. And there's a very nice paper by John Vickers pointing out that in fact 
Um, the merger was probably bad for financial stability as well because Lloyds had to be bailed out shortly afterwards. So there wasn't the conflict that was supposed. So I think that's a useful warning lesson that the nat national interest flag can be raised um, and used in cases where there's supposedly a conflict when in actual fact there may be no conflict. National security test has been used nine times. Um, I think seven of them were up until 2012. Um, only um, two of them then in the last year. Um, the, the national security test has never gone to phase two, unlike the media plurality test. They've, uh, they've always been resolved at phase one. And in some cases, there's been no uh, following investigation. And the way it works is the Secretary of State makes a, a, a notice, an intervention notice. The CMA is then asked to look at and take account of those views. So in national security, it'll usually be the Ministry of Defense or the Home Office, another government department would provide views to the CMA. The CMA will give its competition assessment and its summary of those views back to the Secretary of State. That happens similarly, a little bit different in media mergers, similarly in financial um, stability, where the Treasury, Bank of England, PR, Prudential Regulatory Authority, Financial Control Authority would all provide, all provide views into the, the CMA. So the report then at the end of phase one goes back to the Secretary of State, who then decides, does it go to phase two or not? And as I've mentioned, the Secretary of State has never sent a national um, security case to phase two, but they have sent media merger ones to phase two. So it's a, a nice system. It's very transparent. The process is very clear. Um, and the CMA gets to represent the views of the specialist bodies who can examine the public interest back to the Secretary of State. Obviously, they can talk to the Secretary of State directly. Interestingly, in the most recent case um, <coughs> called Gardner, which happened in July this year, um, the, uh, ho um, home, uh, the, I think it was the Home Office, provided views directly to the Secretary of State rather than to the CMA during the phase one process. So that was a departure from the previous convention. Um, so the, the, the system is flexible. And so the changes that are being proposed, what, what are the things that worry you most about the new system that would be in place? So first of all, the, the, there would be no involvement of the CMA in any of these cases. So that's probably the, the first point to, to note. Secondly, the definition of national security is very broad. It includes things like sabotage and corruption and so forth. But it also has this very general provision um, around um, inappropriate leverage. And that includes the ability to exploit an investment in commercial negotiation. Now, that seems to be a very broad thing, and trying to work out what that means in terms of national security. Um, it, 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 anyway, it's cast very broad. Um, it's also very broad in terms of the sectors of the economy it covers. Um, uh, it, the, the government's view is that it, it will have um, you know, 200 or so initial cases a year, 100 more detailed investigation, and 50 remedied. Um, and it's unclear whether there will be reasoned decisions of the type that the CMA currently produces that provide very useful precedent for firms. Um, <clears throat> so, th so this will all, all be Bayes taking control of yeah. this? So a whole new um, sort of bureaucracy, I guess, uh, regulatory bureaucracy, looking after this totally in parallel to the CMA. And I think it's a little disingenuous to say that this preserves the independence of the competition regime and gives it to the CMA. Um, it's bypassing the CMA, <laughs> but I, I don't think that the, it necessarily means that the system continues to be politically independent. And I mean, you've highlighted two recent cases, the SoftBank arm um, takeover and the Melrose GKN takeover as examples of greater intervention by the Secretary of State yeah. for reasons classed as national interest, but not actually yeah. in the national interest. Did, can you say a bit about what worried you yeah. there? So I think it, it's, the, I mean, the background context here that's quite important is the Prime Minister's Birmingham speech. This was the speech that the Prime Minister gave in mid-July um, at the launch of her campaign to be um, leader of the Conservative Party and Prime Minister. And in that speech, um, she identified, she talked about productivity, but then went on and identified um, concerns about hostile takeovers. And the examples she used were Cadbury Craft and the threatened takeover by Pfizer of uh, AstraZeneca and talked about the need to protect British business from foreign takeovers. So that's the background. And then SoftBank Arm, I think, was announced that the, the takeover was announced the same day that she gave that speech as it happened. So it's very contemporaneous. And in that, um, it was the fir first significant merger um, under the new prime minister. And there were discussions with the government, including with the prime minister, with the chancellor. And SoftBank committed to keep Arm's headquarters in the UK and to double its UK-based staff. 
Um, it offered those commitments under the takeover panel's new code. There was no national security intervention, and the activities, the commitments they made, bore no relation to national security whatsoever. So that case, it is not called by the government a national security case, but it shows the government's, it was a foreign takeover where the government extracted substantial commitments, um, although there was no national security or competition concern. Then, in, um, earlier this year, Melrose announced the purchase of um, GKN. Um, that case um, is, is unusual and interesting in three respects. First, there was no competition dimension to the deal whatsoever, so it had no um, impact on competition. Secondly, it was not a foreign firm buying a UK firm, so unlike SoftBank Arm, this was a UK firm buying a UK firm. And it seems more, less likely in some sense, if, you're, if you adopt a risk-based approach, that UK firms buying UK assets pose national security risk compared to, say, uh, a firm or a state-owned firm from a foreign country that might be hostile. Um, so it was uh, interesting in that respect. And the third, and I think most disturbing thing about it was that in the final analysis, the conditions given bore no, the, com the commitments given by Melrose bore no relation to national security and the government conceded that there was no national security um, aspect to the transaction. But it did manage to, attract, to, to um, get from Melrose a very long series of commitments, and I, I've printed them in the paper, but they fall into two categories. And the first um, is obey existing law, so on pensions, on paying, late payment of suppliers, on workers' rights, and so on. And it sort of begs the question, why does the government need to extract commitments on complying with existing law in the case of mergers? Um, you know, shouldn't all companies be complying with those? The second type of commitments it extracted related to um, future constraints on the activity of the business. So Melrose has to keep the government informed about future plans for the business and has to have a meeting every six months with the department to discuss its future plans, can't dispose of assets um, uh, without notifying the government, um, and has other conditions on its economic activity in the UK. And the thing that's troubling about that, I guess, is that you know, often a company buying another company is going to have a rationale for the deal, and that rationale for the deal may be about making changes. And, you know, we, we know that one of the reasons why we have a mergers and takeover regime and why we allow mergers is that mergers discipline poor management performance. So if a management team is very poor, and if the corporate governance and board of the company isn't able to correct that, then a takeover is often the best way to, 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 to address that. And um, we also know that foreign capital coming in um, doesn't just improve productivity, improves innovation, but it also improves competition. And you can see um, with players in the UK that are owned by foreign players that have a lot of capital, they often have different competitive strategies in the marketplace, more pro-competitive strategies. They're trying to enter, trying to win business. So for all of those reasons, we should welcome foreign direct investment so the, uh, and, and, and new investment. So I think that the Melrose case uh, was particularly disturbing because it suggested the government was prepared to use the threat of a national security intervention, it didn't actually intervene on national security grounds, to extract considerable concessions. And in the background to that, you had a um, pretty unusual coalition of um, interests. So um, unusually, you had both the Daily Mail and the Guardian calling for intervention. Um, you had Michael Heseltine um, calling for intervention and the Unite Union. Um, and, and so there seems to be this situation where people on both sides of the political spectrum seem to want more political intervention in mergers. Now, if we, if we need to have a debate about that, we should have a debate about that. But my big concern with this paper, with this uh, consultation, is that it's doing that through the back door, dressed up under the guise of national security. I mean, I was going to say there might be quite a lot of people who are quite sympathetic to the idea that the government should be being more interventionist, making sure economic activity stays in the UK. And it's certainly the direction that several other countries are also going down. You obviously disagree. You've outlined some of those reasons. Do you think there is a more productive way forward that could deal with some of those concerns mm. and yet not undermine? So um, I mean, President Bush's steel tariffs were put in place under national security provision. So they're about national security. They're, they're not protectionism. Um, and we can do a lot under national security that's not protectionism. Now, if we want to have a UK first policy, like an America first policy, we should have a debate about that. We should have a debate about whether we are hostile to foreign takeovers into the UK. Um, in most of the countries, Australia, Canada, France, and 
the United States that are cited by the Business Department in support for its changes. First of all, the regimes are more modest than, than this would be. Secondly, they don't give any detail on the changes that have been proposed, but if you, if you look at the, the public policy debate in each of those countries, there are many people extremely critical of those measures and describe them as protectionist within those countries. We're going forward post-Brexit with um, the desire to build trade links, to build investment by, in other countries. There are, there's a far higher level of FDI by UK companies into foreign markets than there is by foreign companies into UK markets. And we, we want the government here to be able to, to, to champion UK investment abroad and to oppose protectionism in other countries. And I think this will pull the rug under the government for that because it's very difficult to champion um, anti-protectionist measures in other countries if you do the same at home. So um, I think it's, a, and, and finally, it's not the regime we have. So absolutely, we won't have a big debate um, uh, about whether we should have an interventionist merger policy, get rid of political independence, and go back. Actually, we would have to go back to the 1970s to find a policy that is like that, because there was a, a thing called the Tebbit Doctrine that said that although ministers made merger decisions, they would make them on the basis of competition considerations. And there was a brief deviation from that by Peter Lilly in, 2000, in, in 1991 called the Lilly Doctrine, where he said the, the government was going to intervene when state-owned actors were buying uh, companies. There were three cases under that, and the doctrine was abandoned within a year. It just didn't work. But if we want to go back to that and fail to learn the lessons of the past, we can. I don't think it would be a good idea, but that's not the debate we're having, but it is the impact that these changes could have. And my sense is this hasn't really had a lot of public airing since this consultation was published in July. It, is that fair? Is there, is there a proper debate going on about this? Um, I, I, think, I think that is very fair. I think I've been shocked at how many people I've spoken to about this, be they former senior government officials or people who've held senior roles in the competition system, who are just unaware this is happening, and particularly unaware that you know, the, the, the CMA, the competition regime at the moment, looks at, say, um, 60 to 70 cases a year and remedies 15 to 20. And this is going to be a threefold expansion of that with about 50 cases a year being remedied. Um, so it's, it's a, you know industrial scale expansion of what currently happens in the competition regime. And nobody I've spoken to about this was really aware that that was happening. And I think there's probably four reasons for that. First, the government consulted on this um, last year. In fact, I think it launched its consultation this day last year and consulted on a broad policy direction. And then in June, it lowered the thresholds. And you know, a move that I don't think very many people objected to. And that allowed it to call in many more deals under the existing national security test. And I didn't jump up and down about that. It seemed like a reasonably proportionate measure. And it was under the current system. But I think most of the people I've spoken to thought that was it. They thought the government consulted on national security and mergers, and then they made these changes, and then they called in the Gardner case under those new rules. And then, so that's fa factor number one. Factor number two, the consultation was published in late July, I think 24th of July, and a lot of people are probably just about to go on holidays or going on holidays then, and I think it just made a slip under some people's radar. Thirdly, it has been presented as a reasonably technical issue under national security, and I think not as we're going to create a new parallel merger system with three times the caseload and intervention, and that's going to be politically um, driven. And then I think the fourth thing is, and this is, I think, important, I do think that this and other public policy measures, the debate about it is being driven out by the Brexit debate. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's incredibly important that the government re pauses on this and, and maybe postpones it until there is actually the bandwidth to debate these issues properly, because I think there's a huge risk that we end up just stepping into um, a, a massive step backwards, not, not a step backwards to 2001, but a step backwards to the 1970s approach to intervening in mergers. Um, and, you know, ideally, we, I think we set the date for this event before the consultation was published. So I was coming to talk about GK and Melrose, <laughs> and then this came along. Um, and in an ideal world, because the consultation closes the day, um, this would have been happening a little bit earlier. But um, you know, I was, you. I was going to say, I think you guys have ten hours to put in your <laughs> responses to the consultation. Um, if you do want to, you can always <laughs> skim read the paper and say you agree with it and put in a consultation. Yes. <laughs> Great. Well, in the spirit of debate, um, I'd like to open up to questions at <coughs> the floor now. Uh, we do have some microphones. Yeah, we'll start over there. Please do say who you are and where you're from. Uh, Callum Williams from The Economist. Um, just, could you just talk about what the sort of worst case scenario is here? Because um, 
to me, not knowing very much about this, 200 cases a year doesn't sound like very much when you've got kind of two to 3,000 uh, UK target M&A deals a year. So, I mean, what, what, you know, looking back into, you know, say 10 years from now, we'll look back and say, that was a terrible decision, why? So, um, <clears throat> if there are 50 cases a year remedied, um, then that is a, you know, a hundredfold, more than hundredfold increase in current level of, in of intervention. If that happens, and that happens over 10 years, that's going to be a hugely different pattern of intervention. Apart from the direct cost to the taxpayer of this, and the cost that the company is complying with, and, and you know, complying with these type of regimes for companies is, is a significant cost. There's going to be the cost for every company thinking about an acquisition of trying to have to self-assess against this, and the uncertainty associated with that. All of that is going to deter certain foreign investment. Um, lots of assets are sold by auction, and people have to put in their bids. But if one company's bid is likely to be subject to a, a delay because of a national security intervention, they probably won't bid because the bid will be disadvantaged or they'll bid lower. And just as if you put a restriction on foreigners buying homes in the UK, if you put a restriction on foreigners buying assets in the UK, you reduce the, you reduce the value of UK assets. That's very difficult to measure, but it's a, it's a, a, a realistic prospect. Um, as I mentioned earlier, foreign direct investment um, increases competition um, because of the different approaches that they take and the innovation that they bring in. Um, so there's potentially a loss of competition from that. Um, if, if, um, um, there's potentially a loss of competition if foreign buyers are excluded when, when, when we have mergers. Um, <clears throat> the government has an R&D policy, which is about, we, we've just massively increased in investment in university innovation in this country about trying to commercialize university innovation in British businesses. And a central plank of that is attracting foreign direct investment in to fund the commercialization of, of, of investment in British businesses. And a lot of the core sectors that this is targeted to are things like quantum mechanics, artificial intelligence, etc. And exactly the area where the government's own innovation policy is trying to get foreign capital into the country. Um, and I think it's also going to weaken the government's ability to champion protectionism abroad and I think it sends a very negative signal post-Brexit about the openness of the UK economy. Um, if this is how we plan to use our Brexit freedoms to deregulate and, and embrace free trade, it sends a very negative signal about both of those things because it's a big regulatory measure. So how do you add up the cost of all those? I think the, the, um, that is the challenge. There's a short-run political benefit here and a long-term diffuse cost, but I think that cost is very large. Um, but it's diffuse and difficult to measure. Do you have another question down here? Thank you. John Penrose, Member of Parliament. Um, John, can you just expand a little bit on that last point about the message which we're sending post-Brexit if we're trying to be a sort of global free trading citizen? And can you also expand a bit on, presumably there is an argument to say that you would expect potentially more competition cases for different reasons than the ones that are being advanced by the government in this com in this consultation, um, if you are saying that we're going to have to you know, take the cases which will currently go to Brussels under their competition policy uh, 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 regulators, yep. um, and if you want to try and sharpen competition in the UK because we've had huge cons you know, consolidation of British businesses and increases in in uh, in, in, in profit margins. Um, so actually, it's a very nice point, John. It's not in the paper, but the. At the same time this is happening, it is expected that the CMA will have to deal with an extra 60 to 80 cases a year that currently benefit from the one-stop shop in Brussels that arises from our EU membership. And so very, very large global cases and large European cases currently go to Brussels. So for example, the attempted Deutsche Börse um, LSE merger, etc., etc., um, SAB Miller, um, Anheuser-Busch InBev, all of those sort of cases would require separate clearance from the UK post-Brexit. Uh, so this will happen at the same time the CMA itself is, is, getting, is getting much busier. In terms of the broader signal um, about Brexit, I think um, it is totally reasonable for the government to want to have a targeted approach um, towards national security. Um, but I would like it to be targeted. Um, and there's much more we could do if, if the government's going to go down this route, in narrowing the scope of this and being very clear what it applies to. And it could apply to investments from hostile, from you know, companies or state-owned companies in, in hostile foreign um, uh, nations. 
Um, it could be much more focused on specific espionage and so forth. But I'd like to see a lot more as well on what we're doing in terms of beefing up the security services to deal with these issues because we have a large stock of existing investment. And it's not obvious that we shouldn't be as concerned about that as, as about um, a new investment. And we shouldn't be relying on the trigger event of a merger or an investment to be the thing that causes us to worry about espionage. Like the, the worst types of espionage often come from an individual inside a business engaging in theft or manipulating something. And you don't need to own the business to do that. In fact, buying a piece of infrastructure in the UK in order to um, to, to have a, a malign effect on national security seems to be a peculiarly expensive way of doing it relative to the alternatives available. And if, you, if you're a Chinese buyer investing in a port in Britain, arguably you have quite a lot of risk as well that the government could appropriate your asset at some stage in the future. Um, so it's, it's unclear to me that the, the policy has been thought out very clearly. And you know, we, we will want more foreign investment into the UK post-Brexit and we will want, I hope, to champion or to oppose protectionist policies in other countries as part of our signing free trade agreements. And I think it'll be much more, to do, much more difficult to do so if we're seen as being the country that has most expanded its national security provisions of any country, because the changes in America, Australia and so forth are modest by comparison with what we're doing. Okay. Any more questions? Can I pose one of my own then? Um, does, does the government actually have any case, past cases that it can point to to say this was problematic in the past and we weren't able to intervene and we would be able in the new system? No, I interestingly, the, the, the consultation paper does not point to a single case where the government believes that the case was cleared, went through, and there was a national security issue. Now, I can understand why they mightn't want to give the names of cases, but the consultation paper doesn't even say that there was one. So um, the gap is all is couched in two terms. Um, the, not, not past cases. It, it, one is um, the, the, the rising security threat, um, and the second is that other countries have provisions like this. Um, but, but more than that isn't said in terms of motivating this. And certainly it's difficult to see how, you know, we've, we've had these nine interventions so far, and most of them have not actually, sorry, nine cases examined. Um, and a, 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 small, a smaller set of interventions than that. So uh, we're going to go to 100 cases being examined and 50 actual modified. Um, and it's difficult to see how the national security um, landscape is changing by 50-fold, to justify 50-fold increase in intervention. So, um, you know, in fact, if the government hadn't put those numbers in the paper, um, it would be less concerning. So I, I applaud their honesty in putting the numbers in the paper, <laughs> but the, the numbers in the paper um, are certainly, um, you know, suggest there's something else going on here. Can I just probe a bit more the answer you gave to Callum? Um, so you said that one concern about this regime is that foreign investors would think twice about investing in a UK company. Are there any other countries that have a similarly interventionist regime that you could point to that currently shows us how this discourages foreign investors? I mean, quite a lot of countries have um, separate rules on foreign investment. So, for example, the United States has a, a committee called CFIUS, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, which is a security committee. The, the, um, there are people in this room far more expert on it than me. I'm looking at John Davis from Freshfields here, who um, has written about this. Um, and, and, and that has been used uh, famously, for example, Dubai, the Dubai government investing in ports in the United States mm -hmm. and used recently in a number of cases. It's, by, it's a presidential discretion, presidential decision, and it's outside of the competition authorities. Um, the numbers of cases, I think, in recent years are, are probably on one hand. Uh, and it is criticized in the United States for being protectionist. Um, uh, John is going to, John, you're going to say something. <laughs> Me, John, thank you. I just wanted to, to say, first of all, I, I agree with pretty much everything you said. So for those who thought you might were a bit alarmist, uh, I think we are expecting a sea change. And I wanted to make the observation about um, the, 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 the issue of uncertainty for, for investors. Um, certainly for the first few years, it'll be very difficult for, uh, for people to make judgment calls not to go and approach the government because they won't know what the outcome is going to be. And, and, the, and the unpredictability of the CFIUS process in the US is, is, is a good example of that. 
The other thing is that governments around the world are learning from each other uh, to, in order to expand uh, the way in which they might intervene. So, you know, the number of cases that John is talking about is very significant, I mentioned in the paper, and of course at the moment there is no mechanism for dealing with that. There is no equivalent to the CMA for dealing with national security. So, um, you know, the, it may well be through the consultation, the government understands these things, it may seek to perhaps narrow down the scope of some of the provisions, but I am doubtful about that because the, the paper makes it clear that although uh, they're indicating in the paper the areas that are of most concern, they do reserve the right to call in anything. So the uncertainty for business, whether uh, being foreign investors or other, is going to be very considerable indeed, and, and for, to my mind, a sea change. Thank you very much. I mean, is it, it sounds like that's very much in support of your position. Is that that's your? Yeah, I mean, and the, the I think the like the last case blocked in Australia it was about three years ago was a land purchase by by a Chinese entity, um, and there's a big concern in Australia with. Chinese companies buying um, farms in Australia, like very large farms, uh, probably the size of Wales or something. But um, but there's a concern with them being owned from a strategic point of view. It's a, you could call that a national security concern. It's been used in Australia like that, but most um, other deals in Australia have have been have not been um, looked at from the at, at this at this level at all. Mm. I mean, obviously in France, we're all familiar with the the famous yogurt case where the government described said Danone was a strategic interest. Um, but the government does cite approvingly the French approach to this in, in support of this. So, um, and I, I thought in, in, in uh, July 2016 that it was ironic that in Theresa May's speech that the UK, having advocated against protectionism in the European Union for 20 years, immediately sought to use the freedom from the European Union <laughs> to do a U-turn on that and say, well, we, shouldn't be, we should be protectionist now. Um, and I do think there's something quite ironic in the fact that the, the UK, now that it's leaving the European Union, is, is reversing its approach to openness of markets that it really was the strongest, the strongest champion of in the European Union for the last 20 years. I mean, are these changes the changes we could have made as a member of the EU or would this have been prevented by...? I think a lot of this could still be done under the auspices of the, our EU membership, yes. Um, uh, it would be, it could be challenging for cases that are go to the go to Brussels under the one-stop shop. Mm -hmm. But there is a provision in EU law for national governments to apply a national security test, um, and so they could do um, really, I think, probably 90% or more of this um, without leaving the in, in, within the constraints of the EU. Have you spoken to people across the political spectrum about this? Is your sense that these are proposals that would survive a change of government? Um, <laughs> well, I mean, I think, you know, the, uh, the, the, the opposition has not said what it would do with merger policy um, if it were in power. Um, but if these changes came in, it might not have to do very much <laughs> to go back to the 1970s approach. So, um, it, 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 you know, it might be that, uh, and I haven't engaged with, uh, with, with, with opposition or conservative politicians about this in writing the paper. The paper's written very much from a, a technical expert viewpoint about the cost to business and the cost to the economy and, and slightly less the, the politics of it. Um, but, but it seems to me that, that um, it would enable a very large scale of intervention um, in the event that the new government wanted to do that. I also think, I mean, the, the, it's important to note this in the context of what's going to happen with state aid as well, because state aid has been given to the Competition and Markets Authority, and state aid and mergers have the shared feature um, that politicians find it very difficult to resist the siren calls of people who want to protect jobs or something else. And as you saw with this, the case of the British steel industry, you know, I think before that blew up, Many people in this country were unaware that Britain still had a steel industry. Um, and suddenly the calls to protect um, uh, several thousand jobs became um, politically very difficult for the government. But the government has always relied on the independence of the European state aid regime to be able to say, we're powerless to act on this and we have to deal with other solutions. And we have to allow the sort of, you know, the, the incentives of the market to drive efficiency to, to work in these cases. Um, and post-Brexit, that power is going to go to the CMA. 
And it's interesting to see how the government is going to resist similar, I guess, political calls. And it's very difficult. The reason we make competition policy, as with interest rate setting, politically independent, it's very difficult for a politician to resist the short-term benefit that comes from appeasing shareholders, uh, stakeholders, in, over the long-term interest of getting the right decision for the economy. And wherever there's a change, um, and you know, the, a merger or a state aid will change, um, it, you know, have changes for employees, it'll have changes for suppliers, it'll have changes for competitors and other stakeholders. And wherever that happens, um, the desire to run to politicians and say, please stop businesses doing this, can be irresistible. And so we, as Odysseus needed to tie himself to the mast, politicians um, create independent agencies in exceptional cases like monetary policy and competition policy and state aid to try and um, make sure we have a better performing economy. So, I mean, on that point, actually, so you're, you're kind of making two criticisms. One is the expanded scope of what would be considered in a security concern. And one is that the decision is moving from the CMA into the business department. Would, would your concerns be much mitigated if, if only the first of those things happened, that the remit was widened, but it, the decision was left with the CMA? Well, the, 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 um, the decision won't, won't be le wouldn't be left with the CMA because even under the current provision, um, at the end of the day, the public interest issue is decided by the minister. I think with our current narrow but quite effective public interest test, that's wholly appropriate. And it has been used wholly appropriately um, where it's been used. It's the threat of using it has been, used, has been done inappropriately, actually, not the actual use itself. Um, but I would be concerned if, if it's, you know, with anything like this, once you introduce a ministerial ability to take a decision, the minister can come under pressure. I think it's good that um, in all the cases that we've had, um, other than Lloyd's H. Boss, which I think is a really good example of what can go wrong, um, that the minister has has resisted the um, any urge to make a broader decision than the pure national security one. I mean, we actually had Paul Tucker here a few weeks ago talking about uh, unelected technocrats taking important public policy decisions, and what you're describing here is this decision about public interest seems inherently a political one. Is there? A, given that we will not be in the EU and you were saying that that was the sort of external constraining force on politicians to not give in to these sorts of uh, lobbying, is there another way forward for the UK outside the EU that would constrain politicians not to, to come under well, pressure? I mean, I, I think the, first of all, I think the current system works well in, um, in competition policy. Having ministers decide on enforcement cases or big investigations um, or mergers or state aid is just a very difficult thing to do. And when that happened in the past, the system basically was, um, you know, lobby rooms, lobbyists on every side going in, um, lots of wasteful rent seeking. It was very unseemly. People I've talked to uh, who were involved at the time, and the way in which decisions got made were quite largely dependent on which private interest happened to be the strongest at the time. So I think public interest sounds like a great term, but actually it usually resolves in practice to the strongest private interest when these, when these decisions are made politically. So I think that's a reason for trying to make sure they're very transparent processes and that as much as possible you don't expose politicians to having to make decisions that are in technical areas where there are short-run political costs but long-run economic benefits. Now, there are areas where you do need to recognise that um, mergers could be um, problematic even if the competition aspects are dealt with. And there are two scenarios. One is where a merger is not anti-competitive, um, but you, you think you should block or remedy it for another reason. That's, the national security one is ostensibly there, but also plurality has that feature. So you might not mind two newspapers merging because advertisers have so much choice but you might care about it in terms of the, the diversity of reader opinion um, in a political democracy. And that's a different consideration, and that's a consider consideration best decided by a politician. But it's good to have a transparent process, because even with media mergers, you don't want powerful media interests to be seeing the minister in private and putting a lot of pressure on. So we have an excellent system with Ofcom giving opinions, the CMA doing it 
all highly transparent. It's a really good system. Ireland has a similar one. I think it works well too. The other example is the one where the competition authority comes to the view that the merger is anti-competitive and the government allows it. That's what happened in Lloyd's H-Boss. I, I reference a, a case, a defence case in the paper. The OFT, under my jurisdiction, cleared a defence merger at phase one that appeared to have an anti-competitive effect, but the Ministry of Defence told us that they were the only buyer and they didn't see any problem with it and therefore we couldn't take it to phase two because we didn't have any evidence that there was going to be harm because the buyer. So I give that as an example of another merger where an anti-competitive merger may have happened um, even though um, we thought there would be anti-competitive harm. Those are the only two cases I'm aware of in the last 15 years that have that feature. But the national champions argument, which is what it is, that we need to create a domestic monopoly for some reason is deeply flawed. Um, it's pretty outdated in the UK, I haven't seen it raise its head, but you have heard um, Chancellor Merkel talk about the Alstom Siemens deal in those terms, in competing with China recently, and you, you get it also in small economies, it's used much more in Ireland and countries like Ireland, that we need to have a, a player that's big on the, um, on the global stage, uh, uh, big in the, uh, the Irish stage to be able to compete globally. It's, a, in my view, a fallacy of an argument. It's not one that appears in the UK. Interestingly, under this provision, it would enable it to happen more often if the case arose. And the, the paper acknowledges that if the government thought it was in the interests of national security to allow a monopoly merger, it could do so. And so given what you said about the UK having been quite a strong voice in encouraging other European countries to actually have a less protectionist regime, do you have any sense of where Europe might go without the UK playing that role? Um, <clears throat> or has gone. Um, <laughs> I, th I, think, um, I think the, the European Union um, case law on competition applies here and will probably continue to be applied. There was a recent case in the Court of Appeal where the Court of Appeal didn't use the Article 60 provision whereby... EU law is directly applicable, but instead cited um, European case law in the same way it was cited the US Supreme Court. And I thought that was quite interesting because it was showing that the, the Court of Appeal, I think, was showing its ability to have regard to and, um, and keep consistent with EU law, even if there's no legal requirement to do so, if you think the EU law, EU law has got that right. So I think at the court level, um, there won't be a huge divergence um, there. I do think that over a 20-year period, there is a risk that the European Union becomes more interventionist without the UK voice at the table. The UK voice has been the strongest pro-market voice. But the way the UK is at the moment, it is arguable that that risk would be even greater if we were staying in. I mean, so I don't know what way to, <laughs> what way to answer that question because you know, I don't know if the reason we've become protectionist on merger policy is because we're leaving the European Union or that's just happened anyway and we would be doing it if we were still in the European Union. Great. Are there any more questions from the audience? Alistair? Going back to the issue of independence, do you think that what you've been talking about is part of a wider picture of the government losing confidence in the importance of independence within the competition system? I mean, we've seen other things like the Secretary of State writing to the CMA asking them to, under, to undertake a market inquiry of the audit market, which yeah. is not the sort of thing that governments have done in the past. Um, <clears throat> yes, Alistair, I, I mean, I, I do think it is. I think um, we've seen, uh, you chaired the banking inquiry, but we've seen in the energy inquiry that the CMA chaired how after that inquiry was published, the government decided to introduce a price cap in respect of certain energy prices. That was pretty unprecedented. The government's looking at the rail franchising system. So there are aspects of our regulated markets where the government, I think, doesn't believe that the current system is working well. Some of that may reasonably be about whether we have the right system of regulation to deal with, with the issues we have. But I think part of it is also a, a, a lacking confidence that, that, if you like, that commerce and business and markets deliver. Um, the, the, the request to the CMA to do a market study into the auto profession, I think, is unprecedented, um, as is the appointment of a former politician, uh, excellent though that person may be, 
um, to run the CMA previously, that's been a more, seen as a more technical, um, politically neutral role. So I think there's quite a lot going on in the system that suggests um, a heightened level of political interest in, in the, 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 um, the competition and consumer regime. Um, now, I think the current regime has lots of good safeguards in it. The decision making is independent, it's subject to the courts. Um, and I think, we, I think it is reasonable for a Secretary of State to express concerns. So when, for example, in 2006, um, I took the view that there was a problem with airports in this country, of course I consulted with Her Majesty's Treasury and the then DTI and a number of other um, stakeholders um, about that. Um, not unfortunately, as it happens, the, <laughs> the Office of Rail Regulation, because they were rather, an, or Office of Airport Regulation, or their Civil Aviation, or they were rather annoyed, I think. But um, we did consult with the government because we wanted to understand whether the government um, thought we should be using the powers in those ways. But the, the board of the OFT at that time absolutely thought it was independent in exercising those powers. We also ran a triage system where we looked at possible candidates for market studies and we invited government departments and consumer groups and others um, along to participate in that to see which of the markets did they think raised concerns and we adopted a very open process around that. So there's always been a level of debate and discussion between the independent agencies and the government about priorities and areas for concern and I, I don't think that in any way interferes with the independence. I, I, I do think the, the audit, I mean, the, the audit one doesn't to me go over the line, but it goes closer to it <laughs> than I've seen anything go before. Um, um, I think it's reasonable for the Secretary of State to say, I'm concerned about this, could you look at it? Um, uh, that's a reasonable thing. But it's really important that the CMA in deciding to do that feels in its own mind that it's doing so independently. There's another question about that. Hi, um, my name is Dan Tomlinson and I'm from the Resolution Foundation. Um, a question on the politics of this. It's quite interesting you're saying, you know, the Guardian um, and the Daily Mail, Tory grandees, etc. A whole range of people support the idea of a more interventionist, protectionist policy. So it feels odd to me that the government hasn't just come out and done this in a more open way and has instead tried to do it through the back door, as it were, with a um, national interest test consultation that's published at the start of the summer. So I'd be interested just why you think they've decided to do that. And then a broader question. Um, so they're doing this move because now we've got Brexit and they can do different things. Would you do something different? As in, yes, you do, yes, you do something different, I'm sure, but what would you do to change competition policy after Brexit? Okay. The first question is a, um, a really excellent question. I think that if the government consulted on being able to intervene generally in the way it intervened in Melrose, GKN, a lot of people would say no to that. Because what happens is you get very different answers when you look at individual cases with identifiable winners and losers than you do when you discuss a principle. And in fact, that's the reason why we have a politically independent approach to doing a lot of this, is because you can have the discussion in the abstract, and when you're not talking about individual winners and losers, agree what the principles should be and put a rule in place on that. But then when it comes to an individual uh, case, everything's, oh, well, this should be an exception, this should be an exception. And I think if you consult on the general approach, the government might find it, it wouldn't have support for that. But it's a really good question, and I'm not sure the answer I've just given um, is the best answer to that, and others may have a better answer to it. Um, on your second question about our competition regime um, um, generally post-Brexit and the competition regime generally, I, I didn't come here to speak broadly about this, but I think we have two or three problems with our competition regime that people who know me well will have heard me rant about for at least a decade. One of them is that the Competition Appeals Tribunal is overly intrusive. Um, it rakes over evidence, calls new witnesses, and, and it reduces fines in almost all cases, which is like an invitation for everything to get appealed. That, that has two effects. It, it means the CMA has to gold plate every investigation, and it means that everything gets appealed, which is doubling the workload of the CMA in fighting all of the appeals, and it means we have fewer competition cases for both those reasons, many fewer than we might have. Um, and I think it's bad for, for that reason. Um, I don't think that it's not, this is not about uh, judicial scrutiny of cases. And that's been going on for a very long time and it's deeply problematic. Now, why is that relevant to Brexit? Post-Brexit, when the European Commission is bringing a case, like a case against Google on Android or shopping, the CMA is going to find itself in an extremely difficult position. Because on the one hand, the European Commission and other competition authorities are going to be doing those cases. On the other hand, it's going to think, 
if I'm taking a case against uh, a large company on abusive dominance under the UK law, and I have to fight that before the Competition Appeals Tribunal, I'm looking at another 10 years of um, you know, 20, 10, 20 people a year doing that, as we've had with um, you know, MasterCard and Visa type litigation, um, with the, you know, cases like dairy um, um, and, and other cases I was involved in that did go on for the best part of 10 years. And, and that's just going to put them in a really difficult position because they're not going to, they're going to want to, there's going to be a lot of political and public expectation that they will bring cases like that. And there's going to be a really difficult resource conversation, especially as they have to do all these extra mergers and all these extra state aid cases that they have no discretion over, and then to have that pressure and the, those resource constraints. So that's one issue that I think needs to be addressed. Second issue needs to be addressed post-Brexit is that the and I don't mean to upset anybody, uh, very excellent people like Alistair in the audience who sat as panel members, and, and Philip Marsden who's here as well, um, and any other former panel members I may have missed. Um, the, the UK system with its phase one, phase two, with all of these extra global cases is not going to work terribly well in an international environment. The Justice Department in the United States, the European Commission, the ACCC in Australia, they're going to want to talk to the head of the CMA about cases at phase two, not to the head of the panel. They're not going to want to talk to a different person in every case, unfortunately. The cases are going to need to move faster, they're going to need to move in a different way. And I, my expectation is that I would not be surprised that in, in the business department's five-year review of the Competition Markets Authority and how it's working, that it opens up the question of the panel system and how it operates in the context of mergers, because I think there's a reasonable um, there's a reasonable question as to whether it'll work. Um, so those are the the two big areas that are relevant to Brexit, and then I have strong views on sector regulators, but they're less relevant to Brexit, so I won't deal with those now. <laughs> there's a question there. As Tom Sass from the AFG. Uh, I have a question about the kind of resources that the various regulators that you've mentioned have. Um, so the NEO put out a report recently looking at sort of 80 of the big regulators across various sectors and sort of noting downward pressures on budgets at the same time that actually the sort of scale and complexity of the issues they're having to deal with is growing quite quickly. You, you mentioned in your answer about the EU some of those uh, cases coming back from the EU. Do you think regulators like the CMA and others have adequate resources to actually deal with what they're facing? I mean, the, <clears throat> first, um, the CMA has got quite a substantial increase in resources um, on post-merger of the OFT and the CCs. The total budget was much higher than the combined budget that went into both organisations on a like-for-like -like basis. Secondly, the government is committed to increasing resources to deal with state aid and mergers. Whether that's enough, um, I'm not in a good place to judge. But I do think, the point, for example, the point I made about the CAT shows that it's not just about resources. It's about trying to simplify things. And you know, I think um, it was Simon Pritchard who ran the mergers function at the um, OFT with me for, for about four years, made the point that the, the UK merger regime is the Rolls Royce in terms of its inquisitorial ability. <laughs> um, no other regime, I think, comes close in terms of the ability, even in a very small case, to put that level of resource and quality of people and so on onto it. And there are questions we could ask about whether we, whether we could do it in a slightly more simple way with simpler um, appeal processes and so on. Other countries do that. They have, broadly speaking, effective regimes, um, and we might be able to do that as well. So one, oh, Jill, could be the final question. <laughs> It's actually, this is, I'm Jill Rutter, I'm live tweeting. Um, so I just thought I'd pass on a comment from, uh, which we got from somebody who's reading the live tweeting, which is always extraordinarily gratifying, <laughs> which is, um, is from a lady called Linda Arch, who is just a bit unconvinced by your arguments, I think it's fair to say, she says, in a, in a very nice sort of way, I just need to scroll <laughs> down. So basically she's sort of saying, you know, we've handed this, we've had this system, we've handed this system to technocrats. What we've seen is a concentration of corporate power as a result. And she says, you know, you seem to be giving the impression that politicians are inevitably extraordinarily short term, whereas businesses are the sort of, you know, long term or whatever, and saying actually is that right and not a lot of the sort of implicitly the sort of mergers actually really interested in short term gain, short term share price boost, a bit of asset stripping. Or whatever. So, is should we actually 
be as sanguine as you suggest about the current regime. And I think particularly if you're looking at some of the sort of motivations for Brexit around actually have we got an economy that, in the words of the Prime Minister, is really working for the whole country or have we actually been a bit naive about some of these things? So just passing that comment on. Thank you. So um, there is a debate <coughs> in the United States in particular about whether markets have got too concentrated and margins have got too high. Interestingly, the Treasury has asked a U US economist, former member of the Council of Economic Advisers, Jason Furman, to look at whether our, re our, our competition regime is fit for purpose in regard to some of these issues. Philip Marsden in the back of the room is sitting on that panel along with Amelia Fletcher um, and, um, and other former uh, other colleagues uh, who formerly from the competition regime. Um, let's have a debate about that, but that's not what the government's currently having a debate about, so uh, let's, let's call, call it what we call it. Secondly, this is not about government short-term, business short-term. Uh, if we have criticism of business being short-term, so be it. The, the, the contrast here is the, 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 the Competition Markets Authority and the competition regime is long term. It is looking long term. It's trying to get the right market structure. So it is not about whether the businesses are being short term. And I can point to lots of investments by foreign companies in the UK that started 20 years ago and that still continue and benefit us today. You know, when the 023 merger was blocked by the European Commission two or three years ago, both of those telephone companies in the UK are, run, are owned by foreign companies. So, and they didn't come in for a short-term asset stripping turnaround. They came in to run the business and run them in a more competitive, more pro-competitive way. You look at um, what um, you know. The if, if you're an Amazon customer in this country, you get lots of benefits from the different business model and the innovative approach that Amazon's brought in. And you see lots of other companies trying to match that with their own delivery services. It's not without the costs of disruption. But we didn't stop electricity from being generated to protect candle makers. And we have to make sure that we allow um, new business models to develop. So I, I do think that le if we want to have a debate about um, whether we, we have too much concentration in the economy, let's have that debate. But that's not what this is. And I'd be very happy to engage in that subject um, on, on the evidence and on the merits um, if anybody wants to. But it's, it's not this debate. Well, we are unfortunately uh, now out of time. I'd like to thank you all very much for coming. If you'd like to read John's full comments, um, the paper Mergers in the Public Interest, A Wolf in Sheep's Clothing will be available on his website either shortly or now. Um, and as I said, you have 12 hours to, or 10 hours rather, sorry, 10 hours to get your responses into the government's consultation on these changes. And hopefully uh, John has provoked you to do some thinking on that question. Can you please just join me in thanking John very much for a really interesting Thank you.